Good afternoon. Thank you for coming here on a Friday afternoon. Um, my name is Doss Williams. I'm your first district supervisor, and I want to welcome you uh, to this space because you all help pay for it. it. This is the county's emergency operations center. Um, and as one of the people's spaces, I wanted to, um, I pitched this as the location because I wanted you to get a feel for where everything happens in the case of a large incident. Uh, this is where our, our staff meet. This is where they strategize. This is where incident command often is in incidents and uh, where CAL FIRE personnel are also based. And in some of the more recent incidents, our staff and CAL FIRE have basically lived here, not always slept here, but lived here all other waking hours in this building. Um, and, and so I thought it, it would be a good experience for you. You can't usually just walk in because sometimes there's confidential information um, on the monitors, uh, but this is a special opportunity to introduce this vital facility to all of you and the public. Welcome. So welcome everyone. Uh, we are here for this panel uh, discussion. Uh, the theme is uh, understanding extreme fire weather uh, hazards and improving resilience in Santa Barbara County. So as you can see on this uh, picture, uh, we are very familiar with uh, wildfires. They cause a lot of damage to the community. And uh, the idea is to how we can improve and have a dialogue uh, to improve resilience in the, in the, in the county, okay? Um, the idea for the workshop, uh, the public uh, panel discussion was a collaboration with uh, uh, the Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management, um, UCSB, and also the Santa Barbara County Supervisor with uh, Dallas Williams, okay? Um, a few words, uh, I'm a Charles Jones, I'm a professor in the geography department. My background is um, in atmospheric sciences and meteorology. I do research in several topics, but uh, regarding to this uh, panel, um, I do research in uh, regional modeling of sundowners and wildfires. So now I'd like to introduce the, the members in the panel, uh, beginning with uh, Das Williams, uh, he's the Santa Barbara County First District, District Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor Das Williams was elected to represent the First District of Santa Barbara County in June 2016. Uh, Williams previously represented the area along with uh, over half of Santa Barbara County and a quarter of Ventura County in the California State Assembly from 2010 to 2016. Prior, prior to, this, to his uh, service in the assembly, Williams served seven years on the Santa Barbara County Council from 2003 to 2010, and also served as a trustee for the Peabody Charter School in Santa Barbara. As an elected official, he ex has experienced the Jesusita T. Thomas fire and witnessed the devastating uh, effects of lives and homes lost. He strongly believes that we need to manage our fire ecology uh, with our population of residents. Also in the panel, we have uh, uh, Rob Hazard. He's the Santa Barbara County Fire Division Chief, uh, Fire Marshal. Uh, Chief Hazard began his service career in 1988 with the U.S. Forest Service working on the Los, Los Padres hotshot crew. Chief Hazard was hired as a firefighter with the Santa Barbara County Fire Department in 1998, uh, promoting to uh, engineer inspector in 2002, fire captain in 2006, and battalion chief deputy fire marshal in 2016. Chief Hazard was a lead academy instructor for the wildland firefighting and a member of the Santa Barbara County Fire Department Wildland Steering Committee. Uh, chief Hazard has represented the, the county uh, fire department on multiple teams and committees, including the U.S. Forest Service Region 5 California Incident Management Team 7, and is currently a member of the local Type 3 Incident Management Team XSB IMT3. Uh, Chief Hazard sits on the Santa Barbara Fire Safe, fire Safe Council as a board member and the Fire Scope Predictive Services Specialist uh, Group. Chief Hazard is a fifth generation. Santa Barbara native, and um, he currently holds the rank of division chief and is assigned as the county fire marshal. 
In the panel, we also have Nick, Nick Elmist. He's the Wildland Fire Specialist, Montecito Fire Department. Um, uh, during the summer breaks while attending uh, UCSCB, uh, Nick Elmist began his career as a seasonal wildland firefighter for the Sequoia National Forest. In 2002, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Studies and gained a permanent appointment with the Springville Hotshots. He returned to the Central Coast in 2007 as a captain for the Arroyo Grande Hotshots on the Los Padres National Forest. While with the Forest Service, Nick worked in both the fire and ecosystem management programs. His last job with the Forest, forest uh, was the Los Padres National Forest Fuse Officer. This past year, Nick accepted his current position as a wildland fire specialist for the Montecito Fire Department. His work entails developing uh, partnerships with district residents and neighboring jurisdictions uh, to mitigate wildfire hazards and reducing risk within the community. Nick is a Type 2 Operations Section Chief, a Fire Behavior an Analyst for California Incident Management Team 15, sits on the board of the Santa Barbara Fire Safe Council, and assists with instruction at the National Advanced Fire and Resource Institute in Tucson, uh, Arizona. Um, in the panel, we also have uh, Leila Carvalho. She's a professor in the Department of Geography at UCSB <coughs> and a researcher at the Earth Research Institute. Uh, professor Carvalho has uh, degrees, uh, a bachelor's degree, a degree, a master's of science, and a PhD in meteorology from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She was a professor at the Uni University of Sao Paulo for 10 years. And uh, in 2009, she began uh, a professor uh, position in, uh, at UCSB. And she's currently a full professor. Her research interests are in regional and large scale climate variability and global climate change, monsoon systems, mountain weather, and climate and regional modeling. And her current uh, research uh, studies include sundowner winds and wildland uh, fires in Santa Barbara. And in the panel, we also have Mark Jackson. He's the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service in Los Angeles Oxnard office. Um, Mark has been the meteorologist in charge in the Ox Oxnard office since 2005. Over the span of his 24-year career with the National Weather Service, Mark has served on numerous scientific and programmatic teams, including the team to create the 2009 National Weather Service strategic plan to build a weather-ready nation and with the evolved National Weather Service uh, Program Management Office designed to build enhanced impact-based decision support services. Mark has a Bachelor's of Science in Meteorology from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a Master of Science in Meteorology from the University of Oklahoma. So we're going to begin the, the panel with um, uh, about 10 minutes presentation from each panel member and then we are going to open for uh, public discussion. Okay, so we are going to begin with uh, Professor Leila Carvalho. Change the presentation. No. Okay. And there's uh, there's still seats up here in front. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to see it. So thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. It means a lot to us, especially because we have been uh, suffering with all these wildfires, but also trying to find solutions to make our community more resilient. Um, and so I will talk about the fire weather and climate change in Santa Barbara. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Charles because this is a research um, uh, uh, driven. And then also my postdoc, Gajan Duin, um, uh, Caitlin Zigner, as my PhD, all here. Okay, so talk a little about this. Um, yes, coastal Santa Barbara has been experiencing a lot of wildfires, wildfires, we're not new to that, but we have seen these wildfires increasing in recent years, um, almost six times more uh, between 2000 to 2017 a year. So we have almost one event a year we have seen in these past years. And uh, if you look at this figure, you're gonna see that um, most of these fires, they tend to move towards the populated area. Um, and the reason for that are uh, 
uh, these, what we call the Sandown winds, which is our major um, villain for the wildfires in our region. Sandowners are not Santa Ana winds, they are different winds. What we are seeing today, uh, this past day, yesterday, is a Santa Ana winds, not Sandown winds, okay? Talk a little bit about this. Um, so yes, we are sick and tired of all these fires, but are they gonna get worse, uh, or what can we do about this, okay? Um, they are costly, and they are uh, also, uh, you know, costly in, in all directions you look. Um, so what we have been doing from the research or from the science perspective, which I am representing here, um, we have been doing research and we have been lucky, to be honest, to be funded, to bring some attention to Santa Barbara uh, in recent years. And we got this uh, project funded uh, uh, to understand extreme fire weather conditions, hazards, and improving resilience in Costa Santa Barbara. This project started in 2017, and will last until 2021. And um, this is, uh, the goal of this project is to use multi-models to, first of all, understand these fire weather regimes we're talking about, uh, and also in understand how, what's the role they play in fire spread in the case of a fire. Um, improve our capability of forecasting these wildfires, and also another component is to develop an improved evacuation, improved evacuation strategies for our region. And the fourth goal is also to do what we are doing here, to transfer our research finding, to communicate to the public, and also to, to our end users um, that are here as well. Um, so. But we have a problem in our region. If you look at this beautiful area, we have this mountain range, the San Ines Mountains, the San Ines Valley, the San Rafael Mountains, all making our uh, weather very complex. But we also have very few observations in this area. And this is a problem. Those stations, they have, have very short records to study climate, to understand what's going on, and even to, to understand the weather in this region. So what we, we, we do with that, well, we came up with the idea that came from this project we are working on is to, to investigate this, this, this using regional model, what we call regional models, which, we, which are downscaling uh, what the climate models show uh, to a high resolution local uh, uh, region, as you see in the map here, you see uh, the topography. And we have now about 30 years of data at one kilometer resolution uh, hourly data for the entire region. This is a major effort, so you understand. You have to, uh, we have terabytes of data and lots and lots of <coughs> nights without sleeping uh, doing this, right? <laughs> so what we got? I'm gonna show a few things, and I will focus on the summer for the sake of time, and I just wanna show what the model is doing, and we'll show very few variables, but um, this is work in progress. So what do you see here? You see uh, the Santa Barbara area. Oh, sorry. I moved too fast. You see um, this, these lines here show uh, contours of topography. And um, what you see in color is temperature. So it's the mean temperature um, at two meters for the region. And the reds are representing warm, uh, the light colors cooler. So this is an average. This is a climate of the region. And what we, we see in this climate, yes, you have a hot valley, um, you have a cool uh, coastal area, um, and then the mountains are actually uh, warm. In some mountains, the only cool mountain appears here is the San, Ysen, uh, San Rafael Mountains. And in, when you look at relative humidity, yes, you see drier areas in the valley, in the mountains, and wet areas in the coast. So this is what we know we don't have to, to show in a map like that. We know, we understand this. Um, and also, I'm showing here uh, winds for this region. Um, if you are familiar with this area, you certainly agree with me and th with the model that we have strong, strong winds in the west tend to be weaker. So the blue colors are showing weaker winds. The red colors, stronger winds. So on average, we have stronger winds in this area. The western portion of the, the county in this area, uh, winds tend to be much stronger than they tend to be in the eastern part. 
Um, and this is important also because, well, we live more in this area, uh, we have more, um, less population living in this region. Now the point is, what is changing? Is the climate change in our region and how, f and how much? So just to put some I ideas here uh, briefly, I'm going to show temperature, relative humidity, and winds also for the summer so you understand what's going on. So here I'm showing trends. Trends in, in using this 30 years of data uh, during summer. And the way I interpret this, I take, imagine that, that we're taking the average every summer and for each point in this graphic, in this uh, map, and then I calculate the trends uh, of this, uh, of temperature. And you see in red is where temperature is increasing, uh, in blue where temperature is decreasing. So you see in nowhere, no location, we see a decrease in temperature. Red is all over the place means temperatures are increasing. <laughs> and in they're increasing more. The, the, the red, stronger, uh, or the, the bold red, are in regions uh, in the slope of the mountains. So we see uh, where temperature is increasing more. Um, the dots are indicating where this increase is statistically significant. So yes, the mountains are, uh, uh, the mountain slopes, uh, uh, have experienced more uh, larger trends in temperature. Here's just an example, a time series, just to show what it means, a trend. So you have every year, you have these ups and downs, ups and downs, but also overall, you, we observe a trend, a trend of basically 2.5 degrees in 30 years. Um, if you look at uh, the highest, hottest temperatures, then you see a much larger area also with trends. Uh, all over the place. Um, if you look at relative humidity, that's the opposite. So we are drying. So the blues now, now are indicating where uh, temperature, where we see drier conditions. And you see that everywhere uh, in the mountains where we see m higher temperature, you see uh, uh, a drop in relative humidity, about 12 to 15 percent in 30 years. We see in these areas over here. So now, if you look at the winds, in the summer, we don't see much. It actually increase only these two areas. Most of the areas not really statistically significant. That is related to the fact that we have got a lot of these heat waves. When you have to get the heat waves, winds are weak, right? So in the summer, we haven't seen much of the increase in wind speed. Now, what is the implication of this to wildfire behavior? I'm showing here the Forsberg Fire Weather Index uh, that has been used to talk about um, the implications of this for flame length. So if you see uh, a red value, values that are high, high than 39, you see very high uh, potential for very high flames in this area. Um, this has been done during uh, a Santa Ana winds. This was a research done by Max Moritz. Uh, and he collected a few Santa Ana winds just to, to do this uh, calculation here. What's going on in Santa Barbara? If you look at the entire uh, uh, summer from 1987 to 2017, this is the climatology. So you, you see um, higher potential uh, for higher flames in the western part, in this area in the mountains, um, but things are reasonable. But then we look at the trends. Then of course where you see temperature increasing, we start seeing, and relative humidity decreasing, you start seeing an in increase in this index, indicating increasing potential for wildfires in this area. Um, how about sand downers? Well, sand downers are considered the fire weather villain for this area. They are these northerly winds that are observed in the mountains, in San Inés Mountains. They typically peak from late afternoon through early morning, and they can decrease the temperature and relative humidity and can become the most important fire weather in Santa Barbara. Um, one thing I want to point out before Mark talk about this um, is that sand downers are very complex winds. When they say, well, we have a potential for sand downer, it doesn't mean sand downer is going to happen everywhere in this area. This is just showing one example for May 7 during the Jesusita fire at 6 p.m. 
So you see the arrows are showing winds, colors are showing relative humidity. And if you look along the mountains at this time, you see very strong winds, very low relative humidity in the eastern part, strong winds, low, uh, high relative humidity in the western part. So all this variability that happens in the winds, they are extremely important for firefighting and also the forecasts. And this is a big challenge at the moment. And then uh, they're all driven by uh, complex mechanisms that we are trying to understand with our research. Um, finally, I want to point out that we continue with our research and um, we were funded to have this field campaign, a comprehensive field campaign in the area. Uh, and this is uh, where we are going to add a lot of instruments, many more instruments and towers to measure uh, temperature, relative humidity through six weeks next year from April 1st to May 15 next year. And this has the support of the Santa Barbara Fire Department, the uh, U.S. Forest Service, National Weather Service. It has nine universities and institutions involved. So it's going to be a big deal, and this is for the community. And the community needs to be engaged because uh, we may need a community even using space that a community likes to go, and uh, we are going to put some towers in this place. So um, to end my talk, yes, temperatures have increased in this area. Relative humidity has decreased. Climate has been changing, changing more in mountain slopes. Um, and this is, has an implication for the drying of the fields. Um, we need to improve our understanding of those fire weather, the sand downers uh, we are talking about. And I think to increase resilience, we need to improve this dialogue, uh, educate more. It's very difficult to educate a ci all citizens in a, in a place where uh, tourism is very important, so people come and going from different places. Um, and we need to accommodate this growing population with this reality that's come. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leila. So now we are going to uh, have a presentation by Mark Jackson from the National Weather Service in Oxnard, uh, Los Angeles office. Thank you, Charles. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, thanks to um, everybody involved in organizing this panel discussion, and thanks to all of you for being here. My name is Mark Jackson. I'm the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service office down the road in Oxnard. And uh, we work very closely with all of our partners. We are responsible for four counties in Southern California, San Luis Obispo County, down through Los Angeles County, and of course, Santa Barbara County. And um, I'm going to go over what we do for our fire services that serve the public, serve the partners, and ultimately help serve our mission of protection of life and property. And the unique part of the service that we provide in that sense is that we can't go out and we don't order the evacuations. We can't get out there and knock door to door. That's the boots on the ground. Those are the fire agencies, so it's important for them to have that information so that they can take protective actions. So our fire weather services, and what it comes down to is it, there is a term that's a very important term from the National Weather Service. Probably within the last 15 to 20 years, we, we've uh, this, this paradigm shift from typing away and, and sending out a forecast and sitting back and seeing what happens is gone. Now the important part is what's called a Decision Support Service, or DSS. Um, it's another acronym, sorry. Um, if you're not aware, NOAA stands for the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. So um, DSS, you won't forget that one. But what we do is providing that, those forecasts, those watches, those warnings, and the information, and it helps them plan resource levels. Uh, they'll augment staffing, they'll up staffing. Um, it's important for them to strategically place their resources in areas that we might expect the greatest potential for, for fires. In this case, you know, we see on the western side of the Santa Barbara South Coast or maybe above Montecito. So it's important for them to know is it going to be both places or one of the other places so they can get equipment there so that they can quickly respond to these fires. And then we also have a program called an incident meteorologist, so an IMET. And that IMET actually is at the command post, at the unified command, providing briefings, whether it's a scheduled briefing, whether it's a briefing where somebody walks by to ask for information. It's critical information. You ask any one of these people in uniform here how important that it is to have a meteorologist on site at that fire, and it's one of the most important things.
So our products and services, and, and we range all the way from a general forecast product that goes out to about three days that provides information on forecast relative humidity, temperatures, and that change. So change is a big deal. So if, if they see that we're going to see a big drying between today and tomorrow, that's a big deal. Um, we also provide red flag warnings and fire weather watches, and I'll go over that in a little more detail. It's just one more thing to remember, though, is that it's not necessarily a predictor of fires. So I've always said a perfect red flag warning is one in which the fire agencies are ready to go and they, they have initial attack and they keep small fires from becoming large fires. So that's the perfect red flag warning. So it may, not, may seem by the, on, the, on the surface that it was a bad warning, but in fact it was actually a very good warning. Spot forecasts, so you have a fire that starts and once that fire starts, before they can get a team on, at that site and an incident meteorologist, it's important for them to get a weather forecast specific for that location and that latitude longitude so they request a spot forecast we get that to them they get that and then has a detailed forecast of the next 36 to 48 hours of what we expect for winds and relative humidity and temperature and then of course the IMAP program Rich Thompson is our incident meteorologist he's on, been on quite a few fires he was on the Thomas fire um, working long days uh, just as everybody else that works on the fires up to 16 hours a day and um, again, a very valuable, valuable program. So our fire weather watches and warnings, first of all, they both use the same criteria. And it, these are an indicator of critical fire weather patterns conducive to extreme fire danger and or fire behavior. So you ask what fire behavior is, and obviously, just like any two or three year old, if they behave, you, you can predict what they're gonna do, and, you, and not that you can control what they do, but in, in it's predictable. But when you get extreme fire behavior, that's when you can have very bad fires. And you talk about the fire behavior triangle. And the fire behavior triangle, on one side is topography, another side is vegetation fuels, on the other side is weather. Those three components will determine what a fire does. You must have sufficiently dry fuel. So we work very closely with the fire agencies who get out, out in the field, they sample these fuels and vegetation, they tell us how dry or how wet these fuels are. So we can have really strong winds, we can have low relative humidity, but we don't have the vegetation that's dry enough to be conducive for extreme fire danger and fire behavior. So in that case, we would not issue a red flag warning. So we first issue a fire weather watch. So when you hear us say that there's a fire weather watch in effect, typically that means that our confidence isn't quite as high. Uh, we try to look farther out, say out to about maybe four days or so, three days. And we're giving it everybody that heads up in the fire agencies that we're expecting, but not completely confident that we're gonna have a period of, of fire danger. So then as we get closer to the event, uh, we issue a red flag warning. So we had a red flag warning for our Santa Ana's that we're experiencing right now uh, that expires tonight. So we could, we'll see our winds lighten. Uh, relative humidity might come up a little bit. Um, but on its heels, we're issuing another fire weather watch for um, Sunday and Monday for another Santa Ana. So why are we issuing a watch? Not quite as certain. Um, they, the numerical models that we use aren't quite as consistent right now. Um, but just get everybody heads up. Then the warning now, where we've got much more confidence in, this, in these conditions occurring, and uh, it means that those, the extreme fire danger or fire behavior is either imminent or is occurring. So you may not have a fire while there's a red flag warning, um, or you could have a fire when there's a red flag warning. So these are the criteria, I won't go over all of them, but we have different criteria for minimum wind speed, um, minimum or maximum relative humidity. So what we want is we want that dry air, you know, less than 15% relative humidity. We want those winds that are sustained at 25, gusts to 35. And another important criteria is duration. So you have to have those conditions for a certain period of time. So we may have situations where we may have these conditions for only two or three hours. And we call that brief critical. Um, the worst case scenario is when we have these conditions for two or three days. And what that means is that if you get any fire starts, now that fire is, is in an environment of that very dry, very windy, very hot con uh, weather, which really makes uh, trying to get that fire under control very difficult. So the Ready, Set, Go campaign is a very important campaign. It's very universal all the way up from the county level up to CAL FIRE. And the Ready, Set, Go says this. So at the Ready stage, you have your Go kit ready. That's year round. You've got your defensible space that you're maintaining and that you're, that you're maybe even um, building 
that defensible space. Um, you've got your go kit there, you, things you know what you would need to grab if you had to. And then you get to the set stage. And what I'd like to say is that if you hear that fire weather watch or red flag warning, that's the set stage. You're set to go. You've got the peas, you've got the photos, you've got the, you've got the personal papers, you've got the pets, don't forget the pets. You're set to go that in case you have to go, in case the evacuation order is, is given, you go. Okay, so that's, that's why I like to fit that fire weather watch red flag warning is that set stage. We provide this decision support to the, to the partners. As I said, it's not just about sending them a forecast. We're in direct contact with them. We just had a call today. Many in this room are on this call at 1 o'clock today uh, to talk about our fire weather situation down south. You might wonder, why are people in this room listening to fire to Santa Ana situation down south? Well, it's because mutual aid. Santa Barbara County had units that were sent down to Los Angeles County yesterday. So everybody kind of comes together, and there's that mutual aid. Webinars, briefings, direct phone calls, you can't ever replace the value of a voice-to-voice -voice, um, as expressing a sense of urgency. And then, of course, on-site support. I've been lucky enough to be up here in Santa Barbara, right up the hill up here, to provide on-site support for some of our heavy rains and our debris flow threats that we had. Instant meteorologist program, again, there's Rich Thompson. He was there for the Thomas fire for his, they serve up to 14 days, so he was there for that, four, that full 14-day. Um, detailed sport forecast right there at the incident. So I'm going to give you here to finish up an example of um, it's really it's kind of a success story in our decision support services in an incident that occurred in July of 2018, the Holiday Fire, which was right up the road here, uh, and um, give you a timeline of what, what occurred. So July 1st, we had our initial conference call with the fire agencies. We gave them, it's about a 10, 15 minute call. We give them some details on what we expect we might see with this sundowner event. As we get closer, we sent out an email with some specifics on the event, highlighting uh, what the impacts might be for that Saturday, that Friday and Saturday, July 6th and 7th. We issued our first fire weather watch on July 3rd. So the wording in there had, had said that in that time period of, of sat Friday and Saturday, we could experience conditions of extreme fire uh, danger and, and rapid fire spread and extreme fire behavior. So then July 5th, we issued our first red flag warning. And that was a, a capture of, of a post from Santa Barbara County Fire Department. So again, getting that information out through social media. And it's important, the language that we use in there. So it says potential large vertical plume growth. So you've seen these fires, and you see when you get the big, large, what you can almost call pyrocumulus. What's happening is you get so much heat generated in that fire, and there's so much fuel that you get these tremendous um, clouds of, of smoke that really make matters worse down at the ground and, and how you fight that fire. So that's, again, language that helps them be better prepared. So as we move on, July 5th, the direct phone call to Santa Barbara County Fire Chief uh, Ops Chief Woody Enos from one of our forecasters with specific information on what we were seeing as we got closer to the event. An important part of this, down at the bottom, um, our forecasters saw similar conditions to the Painted Cave Fire in 1990. So very hot, very dry, very windy, and as you are, might be familiar with, that was a very disastrous fire, um, the Painted Cave Fire in 1990. Now we've upped the language up to extreme uh, red flag event. So again, we're, we're jumping up and down, we're expressing this sense of urgency to help get fire agencies ready to go. July 5th and 6th, we did more briefings uh, with the Santa Barbara County Fire Agency coordination calls. Then as we go through, we updated the fire weather or the red flag warning, uh, 107 degrees, relative humidity down to 5%. Uh, you can see it for yourself, one of some of the things we were expecting. Holiday fire started on July 6th. Uh, we issued our, we got our first spot forecast request, a little bit later, we uh, delivered the first spot forecast. July 10th, it was contained. Um, un um, fortunately, only 113 acres. Uh, unfortunately, there were still uh, s 10 single family structures destroyed, three damaged. Um, but what I wanna point out here is when you look at where the fire started and the origin point of that fire, and then when you add on there those conditions with those winds coming down the slope, and without that fast initial attack and without the resources on that fire, you can see what's downstream of the fire, and, and that's Goleta. So again, um, the efforts of, of the fire agencies and the partnerships with the National Weather Service 
really um, helped keep this fire from becoming even a worse fire than it, than it uh, may have been. So it was one of the first implementations of what's called a de-risk, and that's where they can get mutual aid um, very quickly uh, prior to uh, state uh, approval, and that was one of the first instances. They had units all the way down from Long Beach coming up. They had units from all over Southern California. Um, and again, Chief Wadienis and his quote about really how far we've come um, with our fire services and our partnerships and our value partnerships. And I'll say one of the most important things about these partnerships is the relationships that we build. And those relationships then translate to trust so that when we give the fire agencies information, they trust that information, they can turn it into actionable intelligence. And so you can't underestimate the importance of building those relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so now we are going to hear a presentation uh, from uh, um, Rob Hazard. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, the expertise uh, from the weather folks here, um, I've, I've heard Mark Jackson's presentation many times, and I'm always amazed <coughs> at the, at the uh, at what the weather service brings to the fire community and then of course the research that's being done at UCSB is is just awesome it's it's um it's adding to a lot of improvements in, in the ability of the weather service to make uh make predictions what i'm going to cover a little bit is now looking at the fire side and so how do we react to some of these um you know the, these weather forecasting tools how to how, what kind of adaptive strategies do we come up with to take uh, measures before fires happen uh, during fires and, and to some extent after fires when it comes to planning and, and how we rebuild. So really what it boils down to is wildfire risk reduction. That's kind of a buzzword in the prevention world. A lot of people <coughs> use that term um, to mean a lot of things. In, in wildland fire, y y the recognition that wildfires they can't be eliminated, they're to some extent a natural part of the environment. In some cases, uh, in, in particularly in the chaparral fuel that surrounds uh, our communities, it's required for the ecology of the plant community. And so what, what the goal of wildfire risk reduction is, is to learn ways that we adapt to it and we kind of, we live with fire. We know that fire is an inevitable occurrence. Um, unlike some other emergencies, it's not something that we're gonna completely prevent, okay? And so, uh, already been mentioned is the fire triangle. and. It, um, for wildland firefighters, the fire triangle is what we live and die by. It, it determines the strategies and tactics that we engage in during fire suppression. Um, for my job uh, as the fire marshal, dealing with the, the prevention side and actions we take before a fire, the fire triangle is very um, uh, relevant to what I do also. It, uh, many of the prevention actions that we take as an agency and that we um, uh, push to the community as prevention actions you can take within your own properties are based on the fire triangle. Uh, weather being the most important component of that fire triangle that determines how fires burn. Weather's dynamic, constantly changing. Uh, we know that wind is, is, is one of the most important things that pushes fires, but also relative humidity is extremely important, as is temperature. And topography. Um, Folks that have lived in Santa Barbara County for a long time, even, even people that have been here um, only a short time, recognize the topography of our county. It's, it's what makes it a beautiful place to live. It's the backdrop of the south coast is the rugged San Inez mountain range. And then we have this huge backcountry full of uh, different mountain ranges and topographical features. And, and that shape of the land, uh, the shapes of the mountains, the passes, valleys, steep canyons, uh, has a huge impact on the way that fires burn. So again, it's a, it's a very important component that determines fire behavior, part of that fire behavior triangle. And then the last part of that triangle is fuels. Um, of the three elements of the fire triangle, we really can only take proactive measures with the fuel leg. When it comes to weather, awareness of weather, understanding of weather, and the ability to predict it is the most important tool we have. Topography is there. It's very difficult to change topography. Uh, I think we changed it a little bit after the Montecito debris flow, but not enough to make a difference in the fire world. So it is what it is. The mountains are there, and, and for our lifetimes, they're not going to change. 
the fuels are very dynamic over time. So we know that um, after a very heavy rain season, our grass crop is bright green, our mountains look like Ireland, and we don't have fires. And then, you know, the, the, the season moves on, we move into spring and summer, our fields dry out, they cure, they become flammable, and we, we have this cycle where we engage in massive amounts of defensible space work and homeowners up in the hills are weed whacking and cutting back bushes and grass and trying to become more safe. And then it rains and everything greens up again. And so it's this constant cycle with the vegetation where it becomes flammable, it rains and it becomes non-flammable and it repeats and repeats. We can take proactive measures with vegetation. We can thin it, we can change it, we can alter it. Um, we can't do much with topography and weather. Looking at the map of Santa Barbara County, um, all of these different colored polygons that you see, all these different blotches of color, these are all the historical fires that we've had over the years, going back to the early 1900s. And what is obviously apparent is that in the South Coast area, we've had a lot of fire over the years. In fact, there is no portion of the Santa Barbara South Coast that hasn't been impacted by fire in the last 100 years. Every square acre of it has been impacted by fire. Some more recent. These, the red areas represent recent fires within the last decade. Some of these are going to be very familiar. The Ray Fire, the Whittier Fire, the Sherpa Fire, and of course the Thomas Fire. So fire is ever present in our county. Um, it tends to be focused in the mountainous areas. Uh, partly that's because fires in mountainous terrain and heavy fuels are more difficult to control. They tend to get bigger. And so those are the fires that get into the historical record and they make it onto this map. We do have areas in the Central Coast where we don't have record of fire. There's no fire that, that we can go back and, and find a historical record of. Doesn't mean that those areas haven't burned, um, but that w it hasn't burned in a very long time. Example would be the Central Coast area around the small town of Los Alamos, um, in the Prisima Hills, very, very, uh, um, uh, you know, long stretches of time where there hasn't been fire. And again, that's given that the climate is more benign, we have lower temperatures, higher relative humidity, and tend to have a little bit greener fields in those areas. And so strategies that we can take to become more adapted to fire, recognizing that we can't eliminate fire from our environment. And so it really boils down to land use planning, education, both for civilians, for education coming from the academic community, the fire community, all coming together to educate ourselves better about how to live with fire, and then taking proactive measures, whether it's fuel treatments, whether it's hardening structures, um, changing land use, maybe from um, residential to agricultural. There's things that we can do proactively to make the community uh, more resilient to fire. Risk reduction boils down to fire prevention. And again, we can't prevent every fire, but if we can stretch out the time between fires, we will have less impact. There's a caveat to that though. The longer we go between fires in a given stretch of, uh, of fuel, the more dense those fuels become. And then eventually, when we do have a fire, it tends to be more severe. So there, there, there's, you know, fire prevention is, is something that you have to weigh the cost. There's cost to preventing fires 100%. Fire suppression, uh, that's the job that my profession um, has focused a lot of, of uh, resources and energy and, and, um, and skill into. Uh, but again, fire suppression isn't the answer 100%. We, we need to suppress fires, particularly um, when we have frequent fires that can actually damage the ecology. If we have too many fires in, in for example, the chaparral, we can damage the plant ecology. We want to suppress fires where they threaten um, infrastructure and, and lives. Um, but again, the, the it's, fire suppression isn't 100% of the answer. It's part of the equation. We have better tools now. Uh, we have better forecasting. Um, we have better ability to predict fire weather. Um, but at the end of the day, we can be successful. Most of the time we are. But there's that 10% of the time when fires escape control. So we need more than just fire prevention. We need more than just fire suppression. So we look at, okay, what about mitigation measures? What are things we can do? Recognizing the fires are inevitable, 
well, how can we learn to adapt to them and live with them? And I think one of the most important things is infrastructure hardening. We do this through fire codes, through building codes. Um, we do it through um, inspections of homes and properties, uh, education of property owners, things they can do to make their house less flammable, more resistant to ignitions. Um, we can do it as a society with public infrastructure, whether it's roads and bridges and communication facilities, all the things that make our society work and, and, and that we rely on are to some extent susceptible to fire. So the more we do to make those parts of our built environment resistant to burning, the better our life is gonna be, the better my job is gonna be as a, as a firefighter. And then fuels management, fuels management, it's the fuel that's burning, and we can take proactive uh, steps and measures. We can engage in programs to alter fuel beds, to be less flammable, uh, where it, it's important. Um, when we look across the state of California, we know that the natural condition of the fuels uh, is very different um, from what it was, say, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. Um, impacts of fire suppression, changing land use practice, um, changing agricultural practice, um, and, f and the, the impacts of climate change are changing the fuel beds over time. And so, you know, we need to look at the fuel bed and analyze what's the risk of this particular fuel bed to the built environment that's adjacent to it. And really the focus on fuels management has shifted over the years from doing projects and engaging in, in fuels modification way out in the middle of nowhere, out in the back countries um, for purposes of fire control to in our current time, we are really looking at managing the fuels adjacent to the populations. That's where, um, where we take our limited resources and put it where it matters to, because to some extent, far in the back country and in the wilderness areas, fuels management is happening basically by wildfire. That's what's managing the fuels off in the back country. Uh, this uh, is intuitive to a lot of people, but it, it bears repeating that the real culprit of our lo um, large numbers of structures that we're losing is embers. It's, it's typically not walls of fire that are coming into communities and burning down our homes and towns. It's embers. It's millions of embers that proceed and come out in advance of a fire. And all of the flammable parts of our society, of our built environment, are susceptible to embers. And so that's why it's so important to do, uh, you know, to take our effort and put it at reducing the flammability of the things that we build and the places that we live. Example of infrastructure hardening, these two houses, and, and I apologize if, if anybody in here, these are your homes. Um, <laughs> the, so this is up in West Camino Cielo, and uh, these houses are across the street from each other. Um, and so I would argue, and I, I think everybody in the room would probably recognize that this home has done a pretty good job of making itself less uh, flammable, reducing its, its potential to ignite from embers. It's covered in stucco, it has a tile roof, um, the, the eaves are enclosed. They've also done a really good job of defensible space. They've mowed down the annual grasses and they've, they've pruned up um, shrubs and trees around their, around their structure. Across the street is another house. Now, in defense of that house, I believe it was on the market, it was for sale and nobody lived in it, but um, <laughs> you, you can see that, and this was early season, the fields are still green, but um, when that grass cures out, if they don't mow it, they're gonna have some flammable grasses right up next to the home. It's wood-sided with extensive wood decks all the way around it, um, and trees that are you know, not very well pruned up and leaning over the house. So, so this structure, has some challenges when it comes to its ability to resist ignitions from millions of embers that would be falling on it, okay? So it's really important to look at infrastructure hardening. That's where you start, is you start at the house. And then we look at defensible space. So defensible space, once you've made your house resistant to embers and resistant to burning, you look at the fields that immediately surround your home. And on the left side, you can see, okay, they did a pretty good job and they survived that fire. Um, sometimes the nature of our communities where you have dense uh, enclaves where uh, homeowners don't have enough space to do the proper amount of defensible clearing, then we could come in and do a, like a community 
treatment around their community. And that's what you see on the right side. This is Upper Mission Canyon. And in this particular case, the homeowners are on relatively small lots. They did as much clearing as they could do. Um, that community was impacted by the 2009 Hayes Aceta fire. A whole bunch of homes burned down. Uh, six different engine companies were trapped and two firefighters were burned. And so we went back in the county fire department and we did a project where we thinned the fuels out at the edge of that community between the community and the wildland area. And so it basically gave them a little bit more defensible space. And that's what you see kind of in this area where there's still fuel, there's still some chaparral, but it's thinned out. And it just means that that fire will reduce itself in intensity as it approaches the edge of the community. And pretty much that, the benefit of that is for the firefighters. We will be able to remain there, take action, uh, prevent a lot of the embers from igniting the leading edge of that community. And any time we can stop the fire as it approaches a community, prevent structures from burning, we can prevent a conflagration. Once we get multiple structures burning, it's very difficult to stop that from progressing through a neighborhood, as you can see on some of these fires that have happened in the last couple of years. <coughs> Some other tools that we have, um, we have um, prescribed fire as a tool to deal with some of our fuel problems. There are appropriate places to do it and there are places where it's probably not appropriate to do. It's, it, there's an inherent risk. Um, you're purposefully lighting a fire. So uh, a lot of times when you want to do prescribed fire is not convenient. As an example, we have a prescribed fire that's in the, uh, uh, it's, it's in the, um, the phase where we're waiting for the right weather window. Last Wednesday was one of our tentative um, weather windows. It was a perfect day on the site of the prescribed fire, but everywhere else in California, it was in red flag. And so now we're looking at next week, well, we're gonna be in probably red flag again. And so my prescribed fire manager just can't seem to find that time when the perfect day to burn lines up with the rest of California. So, but there are, there are uh, uh, places where prescribed fire can be a very effective way to uh, mitigate some uh, fuels. Uh, agriculture uh, is, uh, can do wonders to protect a community. And an example of that is the community of Goleta, where they have an extensive agricultural belt around their community. And that has protected Goleta for, for many, many years. Um, south of us, Carpinteria, again, a huge belt of avocado orchards that keeps that community safe from fire that comes off the mountains. Santa Barbara lost some of that agricultural green belt in the foothills. And so we tend to put more of our focus of fuels management in those areas where we don't have a, a belt of orchards. And then grazing. Um, so like in our northern county areas, uh, grazing cattle do a huge amount of fuel reduction for us. Without cattle, we would have uh, a, a lot more grass fires up in the valley. And then strategic fuel breaks. These still exist across the landscape. Mostly they're up in the mountain ranges. They're in the national forest. We've used them quite a bit in the last decade. They were put in in the 1960s and 70s and literally not even used for, for entire careers of firefighters. Um, and then here we are you know, in the, in the early 2000s um, when this, this current firestorm began and we, we started having these large fires across our backcountry we started using these field breaks um, the way they, they had intended them to be used. And in many cases, they were, they were quite effective. Uh, in other cases, there was nobody there to use the field break, and so the fire went right over it. So controversial. Um, they have their place, um, but they're only one little part of the solution. They're definitely not the answer. Typically, they're located on ridge lines. And then roads is another place that we can do fuel reduction on the sides of roads and utilize those as fuel brakes. They, they actually work quite well because fire trucks can access fuel brakes that are parallel to roads. So some of the challenges we face, um, again, I apologize if this is somebody's house. Uh, <laughs> this is up off Gibraltar Road. Um, I'm sure it's a beautiful house. This is a rebuild from after, I believe, the T fire and this is a difficult house um, for firefighters to entertain the idea of doing structure protection on. To get 100 feet of defensible space on this house because of the slope and the fuels, um, I, I still wouldn't put a fire truck there. I, I wouldn't try to protect this house um, given the state of, of slope and fuel because my crew would probably be looking at lethal heat coming up at them from below but they would be in compliance with defensible space regulations if they had their 100-foot um, 
uh, defensible space done. And they've built it uh, to modern fire resistive standards. So, but this is the challenge we face over and over again is where we are developing into these high risk areas. And I'll finish out with just a, a, a quick uh, snapshot of the Thomas fire and just uh, kind of summarize some of the things I've talked about and, and how different mitigation strategies come together when we have a large fire. And so what you see here is the portion of the Thomas that burned into Santa Barbara County. And the first place that the fire came in and impacted was Carpinteria. And what you notice on this map is all these green areas are the agricultural green belts. And so as the Thomas fire burned across the Carpinteria foothills, it impacted some homes that were isolated, built up into the foothills. But the, <coughs> the urban areas of Carpinteria were completely isolated from the fire, other than smoke and the visual, because of that extensive agricultural uh, um, belt that surrounds that community. When the fire got around the Carpinteria foothills, it then impacted the Montecito foothills, much less agricultural uh, um, uh, land use there. You have tons of homes built right up to the base of the slope. And so the strategies that were used in the Montecito foothills was relying on community defensible space, fuels reduction efforts that have been done for like 20 years in that area, very extensively between those farthest homes up into the foothills and the, uh, the uh, mountain range. And relatively successful uh, structure protection efforts occurred in the, in the, mission, or in the uh, Montecito foothills. Across the top of the fire, we actually ended up using one of these old Forest Service field breaks and did a big backfiring operation and prevented that fire from going into this area of the backcountry. And then this portion of the fire here kind of represents sort of the benefit of previous fires, how when the area burns and the fuel bed regenerates, it's very fire resistant for almost several decades. So this is this area that you see here that's kind of shaded, kind of a gray color. That's the 2008 T fire and the 2009 Asacita fire where they burned. And when the Thomas fire burned into that burn scar along this raggedy edge here, we didn't take suppression on, action on it. We had no firefighters there. We let that fire burn into that recent fuel bed, that very young fuel bed, which if you visually look at it right now, you would not tell the difference. You'd say, well, that just looks like chaparral, but it's 10-year-old chaparral. It's very hydrated, very low dead fuel content. And um, it was a little bit of a roll of the dice, but it worked, the fire stopped. Um, I actually watched the fire hit and transition from these 100-year-old fuel beds into these 10-year-old fuel beds. And it was impressive to see huge flame lengths and very intensive fire drop down and become very, very small flame lengths and creep around through that. And the next day, they sent crews in here and they cut direct line around all of those little fingers of fire. So it really shows multiple different strategies that were used when the Thomas fire came into Santa Barbara. Okay, with that, I'll leave it with uh, this statement right here. So this is directly out of the California Strategic Fire Plan. So this is Cal Fire's state plan that, that basically says, hey, this is how we're gonna fight fire in, in the state of California. This is our, our vision and our goal. And so uh, this to me is appropriate. This, and this is different language than what was there 10 years ago. They've really, they've altered the language in their vision statement to reflect um, the, this desire across agencies in the state of California to become more adaptive to fire, right? And maybe think about fire differently than how we have in the past. And it's, it's the vision is for a natural environment that's more fire resilient. So, so, so the natural environment can burn and it's not a tragedy. Um, buildings and infrastructure that are more fire resistant, so less susceptibility to fire. And a society that's more aware and responsive to the benefits and threats of wildland fire, okay? so. That's the public education part, where we become more um, fluent with what wildfire is, given that it impacts our society uh, so frequently now. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so now we are going to hear uh, Nick Helmikis. Um, thank you.
Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. It's good to see some familiar faces in the crowd and, and some new faces that uh, I don't know. Um, my name is Nick Elmquist. I work for the Montecito Fire Department. I'm one of two wildland fire specialists for the department. So my short presentation is going to focus on a lot of the points that uh, Chief Hazard uh, just touched on, but trying to weave the connection between preparedness and this concept of group immunity how everybody has a responsibility, different responsibilities, but it, it's webbed together and it creates a immunity of, of such that overall improves the resilience of, of the community as a whole. I just wanted to point out a, a quick picture of a residence within Montecito that was impacted by the Thomas fire, just to point out a couple of the, of the concepts that Chief Hazard um, highlighted. The difference, they've, they've created space from the natural environment and the chaparral up here from the structure itself. They have good defensible space around the structures, meaning a, a fire engine could be there if, if they needed. There are strategic uh, roadside treatments, very little fuel along the roads that the fire department works in conjunction with the homeowner to implement annually in the spring before fire season. And then, I don't know if you can see, but there's a fire hydrant, right? So there's, there's code that's in place that requires uh, the community and the residents, depending on where they're building, to have uh, fire hydrants in strategic locations with uh, distance to the structures themselves. So I didn't want to muck up this slide originally uh, with some words because I want everybody to pause and, and uh, grasp the beauty of uh, the local area that we live in and we're privileged to work and uh, live and and uh, if there's any, I know we're probably pretty biased, but if there's ever an area that's worth protecting, I would argue that uh, Santa Barbara is one of those areas. Um, there's also, you know, a tradition of collaboration and resilience here. I'm, uh, in my biography, you noticed I was uh, a student at uh, UCSB. I was an environmental studies major in 2002. The environmental studies major got its start from a tragedy that happened in 1969, January 28th, a pretty uh, major, the biggest oil spill at the time off our shoreline. It started uh, the, a group, I think they called themselves the Friends of the Habitat or something like that. A lot of interdisciplinary people at UCSB that then evolved to what is now a nationally renowned environmental studies program. Also in 1970 uh, was a group called the uh, Community Environmental Council, which is still very strong and thriving within the community. That year, the seeds of, of, from this disaster created a national movement, which then went into the National Environmental Policy Act. And then state, really uh, subsequent to that, was CEQA and the, the California Environmental Quality Acts. And then eventually, you know, Earth Day, which is still celebrated around, really, I think, the world. So the connection here locally of, of different groups coming together, facing the challenge, leaning forward into the problem, and trying to collaborate to figure out what the solutions are for a better both built and natural environment. So just to talk briefly about past and future uh, fire environments, we talked about fuels, weather, and topography. But I'll use three of our local examples specifically just to kind of emphasize the point that we've had fires that range the seasons, that range conditions, and range burn periods when they've done most destruction. The T fire was in November, as you all probably remember, late season, and it was a, a pretty much a shotgun blast, similar to the paint fire in 1990. Very extreme conditions, sundowner winds, and it did most of its devastation within an hour or two. It ran out of fuels as it, as it kind of got into the community. The Hesuceta fire was on the opposite side of the season, early season fire in May, and it started on, in relatively benign conditions in an inaccessible uh, part of the, the Hesuceta Trail. And then it was impacted by several days of, uh, of sundowner winds on consecutive days thereafter, and it took several days to be able to um, get around that. And then the Thomas Fire, which started in the backcountry up by uh, Thomas Aquinas University off 150, and burned that first night very heavily uh, pushed by sundowner winds and Santa Ana winds into um, really the back door of, of Ventura. And then it was a fuel-driven fire as it made its way up into the Matillaha Wilderness and slowly chunked around and then burned back down uh, the 16th, uh, as everybody well knows, in and threatened uh, Montecito and, and kind of what Robbie described. So my point of this is that the fire environment is one of the most dynamic environments that you could imagine, right? It, it's, it's hard to predict what the, 
although we could predict under certain conditions it's going to it's going to behave a certain way it's really hard to say on what given day are we going to get a fire what is the weather going to do and it's going to be different across the landscape just to emphasize the point that that layla made that it's almost unanimously supported that this trend of warming temperatures is going to continue but what's not really there, 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 there's a lot more unknowns in terms of the precipitation. There's a group out of UCLA, uh, Dr. Swain, they published a, a paper in 2018, and it says in California, 25% to 100% increase in extreme to dry to wet precipitation events is projected, despite only modest change in, in mean precipitation. So what that means to me is that the, the amount of precipitation may not change necessarily, but we may get it more in these extreme events, right? We'll get more drought, coupled with more uh, heavy rain events. And all of that has a lot of different implications to, to, to the fire environment based on fuels. You know, you could get heavy rains that produce a really uh, strong grass crop, a lot of fine fuels that, along roadsides where we get a majority of our ignitions. And then you couple that with drought, which you get a lot of dead fuels intermixed with the landscape. So that's just emphasizing my point moving forward. There's just as many unknowns as there are known. So how do you best prepare for an uncertain future? Just point out this picture here. This is at the Missoula Fire Lab. This is a built structure inside a, a facility. You see a scientist up here, pretty cool job, and they're projecting embers onto this uh, facility. They're, they're uh, putting some um, radiative heat on it, and they're trying to figure out what are the best mitigation measures to build into structures to prevent them from, from catching fires. So there's different responsibilities. A lot of them is review after uh, Rob's presentation, but I, I kind of identify them in three different silos that are, that are connected. First is the property owner responsibility. You could do things like structure hardening, class A roofs, right, which is built uh, into code now and, and uh, pretty much majority of our structures have class A roofs. You could do to minor alterations, venting your screens, right? Your screens to your uh, attic, screens into your basements or, or uh, lower structure lower part of your structures you could cap the end end tiles of your roofs have a non-combustible roof with you know cap tiles you can main, maintain defensible space playing really close close attention to what we call zone one within the first 30 feet of your structure and depending on where you are you know being more aggressive like that first structure my title slide in a very high vulnerable uh, part of the area and then maybe even possibly more in some areas pushing out beyond the 100 feet when necessary. And then there's, there's a responsibility to participate and support research, education, and prevention efforts such as the Fire Safe Council, the Ready, Set, Go programs, the One Less uh, Wildfire, One Less Spark, One Less uh, Wildfire, and plans such as the Community Wildfire Prevention Plans, the CWPPs. Then there's another silo called the community. You know, we could break up into community responsibilities. These are community defensible space, which Chief Adler talked about, roadside fuel treatments, which I showed in that first uh, slide, fuel treatment networks, neighborhood chipping programs, temporary refuge areas, and one that oftentimes is overlooked, especially in these days for some reason, but is probably some of the most important is knowing your neighborhood and your neighbors, knowing where your vulnerabilities are, where is the fire most likely going to come from, right? We're talking about north winds. Knowing about your neighbor that may be older or, or uh, is getting taken care of by uh, their, their kids who are out of town or an understanding and having a network, not we're going to do the best that we can. The, the agencies are going to do everything that we can to protect you and evacuate you, but taking the responsibility on yourselves to watch out for yourselves and your neighbors. And then there's a responsibility on the agencies, right? Developing codes and enforcing those codes. The landscape, landscape strategic fuel treatments across, across the landscape, whether it be federal or state or local, prescribed herbivory, strategic fire uh, breaks, prescribed fire, sustaining green belts is, that Chief Hazard talked the importance of. When we build our plans, being flexible and building in adaptive management, understanding that there's a changing, a changing future and these plans are labor intensive and also very expensive. So accepting within the community, trusting uh, the different agencies and building in a little flexibility so when things change, when we figure out best management practices, we could build that into our plans. And trusting that the agencies that are tasked with doing that 
are going to do the best that they possibly can to protect you and, and the natural environment. A robust and efficient wildfire response. This area is always going to warrant a robust and efficient wildfire response. All of our chiefs are, are constantly looking at ways to, to become more efficient, and they're going to continue to do so. And we're always going to get the most, uh, the, the most resources as possible on any of our front country fires, especially just because of the values at risk. And then just like the residents, there's a responsibility from the agencies to participate and support research, education, and prevention efforts. So all together, you can see there's a lot of action that if you do it together, you kind of you, you create this group immunity. So yesterday I was reading this article about the Kincaid fire, which is burning up in Sonoma County. I think they kind of got it wrapped up. But I saw this picture and I was like, man, I got to try to build this into the slide. At first I thought it was Ray Ford over there trying to take a photo, but then I realized it wasn't from, from our county. But I just want to point out a few things. A, the ember uh, cast that comes across these wind-driven wind fires, and especially from structures. If you, could, if you could reduce and limit the amount of structures that catch fire, imagine the amount of reduction that you get from these embers. But then also, as you see, there's different fuel types that are burning differently, right? Like this tree doesn't really want to catch fire yet, maybe because there's not a lot of ground fuels. But something over here probably has more fuel load. It's burning more intense, intensely. But I think the most important part is this gentleman. With the proper protection, He's pretty darn close to that fire. So if we could build in the, the, the sort of research that's coming out of places like the Missoula Fire Lab, you know, and I think, you know, supporting local universities and, and doing continuing that research and implementing that locally, that we're going to continue to get better at both personal and property protection. So here's a little, uh, we call this the time wedge. I learned it operationally when, when um, we learned how to manage a wildfire, and it, but I thought it was relevant to this group as well. So on, on this side, it's all about options, right? And this is time. Oftentimes, when you, when you move across the time scale, you get less and less options. So our goal when we're managing fires, and I think our goal collectively, is try to provide as many options to the firefighters, first responders and your neighbors and the community as a whole by doing as much of these preventive actions that we've been talking about, Chief Hazard and myself. And if we do that, if we operate on this side of the time wedge, we buy ourselves and everybody a little bit more time and you're much more likely to get a desired outcome. What happens when you don't have time and you don't have options is you get people strung out on roads like the Paradise Fire, 85 fatalities, often a lot of them trying to evacuate. Gentlemen, uh, dozer operator, CAL FIRE on the Ferguson Fire at night, trying to go down some ridge line to push a fire break with not a, not a swamper, very complex operation where strategic fuel breaks, where people know where they're going, they're maintained, you're not having to assume the risk with the fire pushing on you at night. Or the Yarnell fire, one of the worst uh, uh, catastrophes that happened in terms of firefighter loss. 19 hot shots burned in the Yarnell fire in Arizona right outside of Tucson. Trying to go down a, a, a ridge line at the heat of the moment, made a bad decision and got caught in a very bad spot. So the more that we could operate on this side, the better outcomes that we're going to have. And you'll never, you'll never meet a firefighter that, that doesn't like options. Because if you do it long enough, you've been in situations where, where you've kind of been over here and you said, man, I got lucky. But the more you think about it, it's more about preparation, right? It's because somebody prepared and good luck is when opportunity meets preparation. So we want to operate on the left side of the triangle here. So this is my last slide. We like to, we like to say this a lot. It's not if, but when. This is the Thomas fire up on the hill. Uh, one of our fire danger rating signs is showing extreme in Montecito. Having fires in our local environment, like Chief Hazard articulated well, it, it's inevitable. And we could sit around and we could discuss the nuances and, and, and argue of, of you know, why a certain mitigation measure is better during this circumstance and why another one is better there and when it's more effective, when it's not. But in my opinion, and I think opinion of a lot of others, is that why not 
try to implement as many mitigation measures as possible while we have the time to do so. And I think if we do that, we'll have a lot more desirable outcomes, and I think all collectively we'll be a more resilient community. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And so now we are going to hear uh, uh, Das Williams. There we go. Once again, welcome. I will uh, try to get us, uh, cut my comments a little bit to try to get us back on track so you, we save some time for some questions. Uh, I want to take a brief moment to recognize um, some other policymakers that are here in the room um, because it's good because some of you are from their jurisdictions. Uh, Greg Hart, uh, Supervisor Greg Hart is here represented by Chris Henson. Um, we have Oscar Gutierrez from the Santa Barbara City Council and we have Chief Kevin Taylor from Montecito uh, uh, Fire District and uh, Chief uh, Mark Hartwig uh, from our Santa Barbara County uh, Fire uh, District. Um, I want to talk about, well, okay, first, what's the proper role of your decision maker, your, your elected officials during an incident? Um, and what I've learned is one of the most important roles is to get out of the way of people who from doing their jobs. Um, and, and that being said, find out the things that aren't being done. Find, we have a great number of professionals. Everybody that has a job is doing it in one of these incidences. So usually one of your jobs is to figure out, well, what, what thing out there has nobody who, whose job it is to deal with? So sometimes it makes you do really interesting, strange things. And I'll tell you some funny stories sometimes of you know, delivering groceries or bringing in water or other things that you find that are miscellaneous things that nobody's doing. Um, the other uh, role, and I think the most important one for your other local elected officials, and I view this as the most important role, is to reflect on what are the lessons of these disasters and what does that mean for doing next time? Uh, what does that do for preparation and resilience? And I. For one, I'm never going to be one of those folks who tell you, um, because there's a great temptation after one of these traumatic events to come up and tell you, we're going to do this so that this never happens again. Um, I don't think that is a reality in, in Santa Barbara or, frankly, anywhere in the globe. Uh, if you pay attention to these issues, uh, every place has its own unique set of vulnerabilities. Ours happens to be wildfire. And I don't think anybody can ever tell you that it's not going to happen again. Um, what we should be able to tell you is that we will learn from the lessons and do better each time. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to mention in terms of lessons learned is the value of uh, CWPPs. Um, it's been mentioned by our fire professionals, community wildfire protection plans. Uh, this is something that communities can do. Um, uh, in uh, the early part of the century, Congress passed legislation, the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. Um, that's the origin of some of this. Um, and most importantly, uh, we uh, have some of these plans in place, so they are a proven quantity. Um, Montecito is one of those places that has a CWPP in place, uh, and uh, Mission Canyon is another. And in Montecito, I think it's fair to say, uh, and I confirm this with the professionals, both at the rank and file and at uh, the chief level, that really when you talk about the success in, with the exception of seven structures, seven homes and seven um, auxiliary structures of stopping the Thomas fire before it swept into Montecito, there's two lessons of why that worked. And one of those lessons was uh, the CWPP, the defensible space um, that was created um, by that implementation. And then the second part of that was that gave firefighters who were there early um, and had spent time in the community and assessed 
um, where they could make a stands and where they couldn't. Um, there were 300 engines in Montecito. Montecito is not a, a, a huge place. 300 engines, about 1,200 personnel. I mean, that's enough personnel to almost stand shoulder to shoulder um, and, and, and fight this uh, sort of like ancient infantry tactics. Um, and, um, and it worked. And that should be one of our big takeaways, um, that uh, if, if this worked in Montecito um, on non-favorable weather, then this is something that we need to continue to implement in parts of our own community. And the board has. Um, this past March, uh, we adopted the San Marcos Pass, Eastern Goleta Valley um, uh, uh, Wildfire Protection Plan. That uh, is very important, especially when we're talking about uh, some of the places, um, and for some of us, like myself, who lived, lived through the Painted Cave Fire, um, uh, we know that we're coming you know, due at some point over there. Um, so City of Goleta also has one, um, which is, is, is welcome. So the, the, the purpose is to identify areas for fuel reduction, um, increase the community's understanding in that area, uh, and improve its ability to prepare for, respond to, and recover from wildland fires, and recommend best practices for fuel treatments. Um, this is get just a little bit of a slide on it. Um, fuels management, defensible space, um, the desire uh, or the hope is to reduce structure ignitability and to make sure that we as a community have good uh, preparedness plans in place. A um, couple other uh, brief ones before I get into um, uh, dispatch, which is um, uh, another important um, move that the county is engaged in um, that I'll just, some things that I'll, I'll, I'll just treat real quickly. Um, first, other lessons learned. Um, uh, this is more Mr. Fry's uh, areas of expertise, but um, knowing the information that was just mentioned about precipitation that will receive, a, you know, by some calculations about the same amount of precipitation, but in large events necessitates a greater flood control infrastructure than we've had at the past, in the past. And so uh, the county is engaged in a number of flood control projects. Uh, the only problem is um, it, there's about $45 million worth of projects, and we only have $20 million for that. So um, there uh, is uh, creative thinking and grant writing taking place, um, uh, but uh, it is an identified need uh, and at some point, um, we may go to the voters uh, to have an assessment increase in the flood control district. Uh, because if, if we can live through um, the debris flow and ignore the need for greater flood control infrastructure, we would be very foolish indeed. Um, one of the things I could, that if I, I would do if I could is create incentives to rebuild without gas. Um, we had, gas is one of the uh, small contributors to some of the devastation that we had in the fire and flood, but in other areas it has been a real part, um, uh, a, a real source of even greater tragedies. Um, aging infrastructure from gas, um, perpetually does have leakage issues. And if I had my druthers, I would uh, have areas post-incident rebuild without gas. Um, and I think we should also be looking at um, what some people would call new technology, but some people, uh, I would fair to say, old technology with building techniques, right? Uh, some of the most fire-resisting building techniques happen to be illegal. Um, and uh, while we have a building code in the state that is very prescriptive, in the long run, I would say that we should be moving towards a building code that is performance-based 
Um, and so that if you, uh, as an innovator, can build to the performance and still use something like Adobe, um, that should be something that, that is legal or explored at very least. Um, and then one of the other lessons learned by these recent incidents is adequate resources um, really needs to be brought to bear. Um, one of the things that is absolutely not true, you'll see in the press recently in a, a, an article called, called Peak Liberalism, which is the idea that the state legislature is uh, geared towards not um, doing fuel, fuels reduction. Uh, I found the opposite to be true. Um, uh, the beyond, you know, across the ideological spectrum, people have been very supportive of fuels reduction at the state level. Um, the, uh, in fact, the last governor and this governor have both um, taken a little bit of controversy by even using uh, cap and trade um, greenhouse gas reduction funds for fuel reduction, for the removal of uh, dead trees. Um, that those, some of those, those resources, those kinds of state grants helped us with the holiday fire. Um, Mr. Jackson mentioned all the preparation that was made. Well, part of that preparation was using that weather information to then stage equipment. Uh, the equipment was what, a mile and a half away from the fire? It helps when you have it, extra engines sitting a mile and a half away from where the fire started. Um, and um, the, while uh, these recent events did not start us on the path to looking at consolidation of fire EMS dispatch, um, this has added additional energy to our task. Um, uh, we, um, in the, the county, there's uh, uh, you know five different dispatch systems, and um, uh, I know that to some of you, uh, what I'm about to say sh will shock you in the 21st century, but that means that the closest available resource is not always sent to you, um, and that's because one dispatch may be doing one thing, and some of the resources and the status of what another jurisdiction has may be invisible to the people doing the, that dispatching. Um, I think in the 21st century, um, that's kind of preposterous. Um, uh, we have the technological ability to have unified dispatch. Um, uh, I um, would prefer a unified dispatch across law enforcement and fire EMS. That's not a political possibility right now. Um, so we at the board are moving forward to consolidated fire EMS dispatch, which would unify every jurisdiction except for Santa Maria in one uh, fire EMS dispatch and the closest available resource being sent to your home um, because you probably don't care whether you get a white engine or a red engine, um, or you just want to make sure that the closest resource gets to you as quickly as possible. Um, this would be our goal, is to have an operationally and fiscally responsible system um, uh, to EMS dispatch. I, we also are exploring, but not yet moving uh, in the direction of some changes uh, to our ambulance contract. Um, so right now we've made the decision to put it back out for an RFP. Um, we don't know how many entities will um, respond to that, uh, but uh, it is true that Santa Barbara County has never had uh, a, uh, a competitive process for ambulance service. Um, so for all of my lifetime, the existing contract with AMR has been renewed each time. Um, and while AMR does a great, great job, and their, their performance in the whole um, uh, EMS system is doing a, a, a much improved job, um, there are some, some issues. Um, we, um, we have a, a system that is very expensive as you can see from those uh, stats, um, and um, one that can be a barrier, that expense can be a barrier to use 
that expense is also a barrier to how often we, the system is actually paid by the clients. Um, and um, we have the, the strange system where um, for many things that you might not consider an emergency, um, you, we have to dispatch a, an ambulance to perform, like transfers from a healthcare facility to a healthcare facility, for example. This, of course, is, um, I, I didn't want to do too many uh, photos because, you know, we've seen quite enough of them, I think, over the last 20 months, but it's important for us uh, to remember um, that this can hit very close to home and have dramatic consequences um, when we don't learn the lessons of the fire and flood. Um, and um, we, we want to also learn lessons of how to rebuild. Um, I, I happen to be on the city council um, in Santa Barbara when we rebuilt, when we rebuilt after the T fire. Um, that uh, gave some, some good and bad lessons of how to handle um, the rebuild after uh, the fire and flow uh, and, and debris flow in Montecito. One is the implementation of a rebuild ordinance that could facilitate people actually staying in their homes. Um, I don't know, we can raise a hand. How many of your insurance before the change in state law only covered uh, you know, living expenses for two years? You guys know? Three years? How many people just don't know? Right. So um, it turns out for m most of the folks that were victims, or at least a s huge percentage, uh, they only had two years in their, their policies, right? And think about how often a construction project for a home in Montecito or other parts of the county take three or four years. And then imagine that you're some of the people, because some of the hardest hit neighborhoods were some of the last middle class um, communities in Montecito. Uh, think about if you are you know, still working for a living, how you would cover the expense, both the mortgage of your home that was destroyed and the living expenses of the home or uh, apartment or condo that you're currently living in. And you, what you have there is a recipe uh, for losing your last middle class neighborhoods. And um, so we uh, did a rebuild ordinance that did not allow people to appeal the approval of the homes, that as long as a home was within 10% of the size of the destroyed home, that, um, uh, that, that other people in the community could not appeal that process uh, in the hopes that people would be able to get back in within two years. And people are starting to get back in, uh, fortunately, both yellow tags and even a red tag. Um, the other um, element to this that's important for going forward because uh, a like-for-like -like ordinance isn't exactly unheard of. We did one back in the T fire, but uh, what we did differently in the, after the Thomas uh, fire and debris flow is we allowed people to move that footprint of the home. And the reason we did that is because we don't want them to build as close to the creek or in the part that's low um, that, that caused the structure to be destroyed in the first place. So we, we wanted to encourage people or give people ability to move that footprint of that home to a more resilient part of the parcel. I'm gonna end there just with the, the um, one more lesson learned, which is just, you know, w scientists never say climate change is causing uh, extreme uh, weather events or the increase in sundowners. But it's clear from uh, Dr. Carvalho's research that they are correlated, that, this in, that the climate change that the, we are experiencing um, are correlated with increased sundowners. If we know that fact, then we know that climate change is, a, is likely to be a driver here. And one of the greatest lessons learned is um, we can all do our part um, to fight climate change uh, by our own conduct and our policies as a community. And your Board of Supervisors is determined not only to learn for the lessons of the fire and flood and to implement 
uh, that in our public safety policy, but to also do our part to fight climate change. Thanks so much. Thank you, panel, um, for the very educational and uh, informative uh, presentations. So we'd like now to open for uh, questions, and I'd like to ask that if you have a question, uh, please use the microphone on this side, and, uh, and you can even form a, a line over there so we can efficiently use. Um, I'm on the board of directors for the Mission Canyon Association. And I think this is something that everybody here probably has, if you have any kind of responsibility. And you talked a lot about community preparedness. We all know about defensible space. I'm called the fire queen because I write every article for our newsletter so I can tell you exactly how to evacuate and do everything else. But the biggest problem is neighborhood defensible space. And the fire department seems to be restricted by some of these rules and regulations from really going forward. For instance, just today, I had a, two photos sent to me by someone who was very upset with the neighbor who had stacks of brush and stacks of twigs of fire waiting to happen. It wouldn't even need a big ember. All it would need would be a match that it would completely go up. There's, a, there's another property right across the street from it's got huge piles of, of brush and debris right in the yard. So obviously there's some reason why Station 15 hasn't asked them to do that. But what I would like to ask you is how can we make it so that neighbors can be required to work cooperatively? Because there are many, many situations. Mission Canyon Heights is a perfect example. Rob, you know that area really well. So this is something that I would like to know how this can move forward so that there is a better opportunity to really have neighborhood defensible space. Another big article in the LA Times talked about this. So it's something on everybody's mind. So that's the challenge with defensible space when you're in a dense community. Um, when you're out in the rural areas, it's a very individual thing. An inspector shows up and, and walks around the property and says, this is what you need to do, this is the code, and, and you've got this amount of time to get it done. Or they show up and it's, everything's good and, and you're good for the year. Mission Canyon's a challenge. Um, so for example, the Mission Canyon Heights, um, the, the lots are so small that um, it, it, you can't even get 30 foot of clearance in some cases. Um, and one person's ornamental tree is another person's fire hazard. Um, there's, uh, w we've gone in there many times to do work on the side of the road and gotten yelled at because it was somebody's privacy screening. You know, they didn't want us to cut the tree cause it, oh, that's blocking my you know neighbor. I don't want the neighbor to see into my yard. So, so there's a lot of challenges when you have a small community like that, that's very dense and, um, and it's not just the vegetation, it's everything. It's the wood fences, it's the decks, it's all the, the flammable stuff that, that's gonna impact your neighbor. When your house burns down, it's gonna impact your neighbor's house and, and then the next house down the line. Um, we were lucky on the Hayes fire. We stopped it kind of right up there on Montrose Place. Um, there was a couple moments I was up there, there was quite a few moments when I thought, oh, we're not gonna stop this thing, it's just gonna come right over the top of us and. We're going to be an island. We'll save this street, but it's going to get the next one below us. Um, so it is a challenge. I, I would say um, sometimes it's just the enormity of getting through the number of inspections. So, for example, uh, the neighbor that has brush piles, it could just be they just need an inspector to look at it and say, hey, you got to deal with this. Um, it could be they're going to deal with it, but they just haven't had time. Or one thing that we, we see a lot of, uh, particularly in older communities, is they don't have the economic means to deal with it. Um, interestingly, we had one this week in Mission Canyon on Foothill Road, um, elderly uh, lady that had two dead trees in her yard. Um, I got the phone call that, hey, is there any way you could get the crew in here and do it? And, you know, it, we're not, we, we usually do not use agency resources to do defensible space within that 100 feet. That's the personal responsibility. 
Um, but in this case, a phone call was made to Southern California Edison, and they came and got rid of both trees because they were in the wires. So I was like, well, that was a that's a good solution. <laughs> so that was a win. Um, yeah. So it's a challenge, and everybody has to work together. So there are things that the fire state, your local fire station, can do a lot. And sometimes you may have to go knock on the door and say, hey. Yeah, there's a house that looks like maybe they didn't get an inspection and it could be there's like a thousand homes in Mission Canyon and it's possible that some fall through the cracks so so there's a there's a responsibility on the agency part there's a responsibility on the individual homeowner part and then you guys have a awesome homeowners association and so the things that you do really do make a difference I think it's just do you still have the hundred foot? we do that yes We're not powerless. There's a that, that's actually not true. There's a there's a, our fire code um, gives uh, the fire department um, a lot of authority to um, regulate flammable fuels on on parcels, whether they're state responsibility area, local responsibility. Where we have wildland fuel that presents an ignition hazard to surrounding properties, we can require it to be abated. So there's multiple places in the fire code. Um, it's very easy to enforce defensible space for structures because that's written into the public resource code and there's guidance that's given to the fire departments across California on how to manage that program. Um, whereas the fire code is a very, very, very large and complicated book that is tough to interpret sometimes. Um, but there's plenty of authority for any of the fire agencies in Santa Barbara County to enforce uh, hazardous fuel reduction activities. Yeah. We have a, another question. Tracy? I'll, I'll just be quick. So there's a new fire in the river bottom in Ventura. Last night I was at the McKinley fire. Neighbors blamed the homeless. And I thought, is there, is there a way to house the homeless during winds? I mean, if, if in fact we house them during cold weather, is there some kind of way that we could protect them, which might prevent? I don't know about the McKinley fire, but it's a pretty sure thing. This new Ventura one that just broke out th around 3 is in a river bottom where they live. And I know that's not up here, but every time I go to a fire, I hate using those sound bites where they're blaming the homeless because I feel like we're throwing them under the bus. But if, in fact, couldn't Southern Cal Edison foot the bill for that? Well, I won't speak for Southern California Edison, but I, I'll, I'll answer it by saying there is a way to house the homeless. I'm not sure that there's a very good organized way to house the homeless temporarily from the camps. Uh, the population that goes to the camps and lives in the camps is a very different population than the ones you see um, showing up into inclement weather sh shelters. They're people that they're out there in the middle of nowhere f for a reason. They they want to be uh, you know out in the middle of nowhere. They don't want to be at a shelter. So they're very difficult population um, to outreach to, uh, but it's not insurmountable. I mean, I can tell you um, with uh, the case of Summerland, um, where um, uh, the, you know you can take down one camp and the ca and the camp just moves. So now it's just even closer to the to the park. Um, that's a, a, a what I would say is a not a solution. It's a temporary measure. Um, uh, it, it 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 it's a whack-a-mole. It it doesn't solve things. The longer term work that uh, got done, uh, Heal the Ocean um, funded street outre outreach workers. Um, there's uh, a, couple, a couple of those individuals that you know, uh, moved to another spot uh, out of state. A couple of the individuals, though, from the street outreach work, work uh, are housing ready. And here's the kicker. There's just nowhere to put them, right? Okay. Uh, right. I mean, the. The housing first model works for housing the homelessness. The, 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 the permanent supportive housing model works where you have somebody that's a mental health professional that's on site. You don't just put them in a place and hope for the best. Uh, but there are very few of those facilities. And when we try to build them, people Limby. usually don't like it. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so I guess the lesson of that is um, uh, try to be a YIMBY about some of these facilities uh, instead of a NIMBY uh, because we, we, if we want to get the homeless uh, housed and out from the cold, there is a proven way to do it. It just does, takes a lot of work and it requires having permanent supportive housing like the county has at, Camino, at Pescadero Lofts in IV 
And there is one being proposed in every supervisorial district in the county, one per district. Thank you. Uh, please use the microphone. <coughs> I'm Gordon C. Kim from the Trout Club. Um, I wanted to thank Supervisor Hart's office, Second District, and Rob for getting on the road, which really needed work. And um, that was awesome to see it turn around sort of mid fire season. Uh, in particular, I'm interested uh, in this. Um, Nick, thank you for your information um, on the um, temporary refuge areas, because um, up at the Trout Club, at the site of where the Panic Cave fire, the arsonist, unnamed, doesn't deserve that, um, uh, started the fire. Now it's, it's really cleared out. It's unbelievable. And I heard from Rocky that, uh, through Rocky, that uh, this could be a uh, temporary refuge area. And I'm just really interested in that, exactly what's going on. It's really substantial, what you guys have done. And I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you for that. So, yes, it, it, in fact, this goes to Supervisor Williams' uh, presentation and, and talking about the San Marcos Pass, Eastern Goleta Valley Community Wildfire Protection Plan. In that plan, we identified numerous field treatments uh, uh, that were recommended ac across the landscape for different little communities and enclaves. Um, also, fields management along roads, Old San Marcos being one of them. But we also identified that particular intersection where the Painted Cave fire started as a potential temporary refuge area where if um, if you guys were trapped, you couldn't get down Old San Marcos, you can't get down 154 because there's fire at Windy Gap and it's already taken out the lower foothills. Um, or you have fire above you coming down that you'd have at least a place that you could drive to, park, roll up the windows and survive. And then additionally, it is a very useful place for, for the fire agencies to utilize as a as, as an initial command post for the next painted cave fire we can park a battalion chief vehicle there some engines support vehicles and manage the fire from a place that's relatively safe from being overrun by fire with a great view we can see what's happening with the fire and make decisions based on what we see so that location was was picked because it was a road intersection, right? Painted Cave, 154, Old San Marcos. There's fire infrastructure there. There's a rain catching water tank that the Forest Service put in many years ago, back when they were brilliant at doing uh, projects like that. Uh, so there's 2,000 gallons of water that gets filled up every every time, it, every year when it rains. So we have water. Uh, there's a, a remote automated weather station that the county fire department put in right above that, on that peak, which is an essential weather monitoring device that's critical for the pass. Um, and because of the fact that th there was numerous roads that all intersected, we already had a pretty cleared off area. And so we just, we went in with our crew. This was part of uh, the 35 high priority projects that, that Governor Newsom uh, uh, um, was instrumental in pushing through. Okay, so back to the to the statement of um, that the state isn't engaged in fuels management. They're very engaged in fuels management, more than I would have ever thought. Um, and so they made funding available. Um, they very uh, controversially suspended CEQA, although we did our CEQA uh, analysis for that field treatment. But um, across the state, they said we want the most high priority 35, you know, 35 of the most high priority projects. Every unit had to submit their 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 proposals. We submitted three, Mission Canyon, uh, treatments along Old San Marcos community, and the Painted Cave, which we've completed the Mission Canyon treatments. We're working on Old San Marcos, and then we're going to go up to Painted Cave sometime after uh, October, kind of mid-November. Mid but that particular area that, that we're describing, it would be called a temporary refuge area. It, does that mean that it's 100% safe from a wildfire? Um, it would be difficult to make that statement. Um, all it would take would be a couple years where we don't go in there and mow the grass and then you get a fire and it's it now it's not safe mm -hmm. so at the moment yeah it's pretty safe I, I think you could you could park a lot of vehicles there and the world could be rocking and rolling around you with fire and you'd you'd be very safe um and so you know moving forward our intention is to um incrementally uh increase a little bit more of the separation from the fuels to potentially at some point designate it as a temporary fire refuge area. 
Um, it, it, it's always a little uh, risky to, to say, hey, this is your safety zone, because honestly, we want you to leave. We, we don't want you to have a false sense of security that like, well, I don't need to leave because I'll just go up to the temporary refuge area that, that county fire put in. I'm good. We want you to leave because um, many firefighters have been burned over in safety zones. Areas that we said, hey, this, this is a safety zone. Well, a safety zone is only safe when you, when you base it on a fire behavior prediction. And, and if you mess up your fire behavior prediction and you anticipated 20 foot flame lengths, but you got 50 foot flame lengths, guess what? That safety zone is probably not good enough and it's not gonna be a place you wanna be. So, so again, it's, it is there. I would rather be there than down in the trout club, trapped at my house, because you really don't have anything safe down there. Um, but ultimately, I'd rather get on the road and go down to, you know, go down to the creek side and, and watch it from the bottom of the hill. That's your best bet. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Hi. I wanted to ask you, um, with Southern California Edison, you know, shutting off power potentially and um, people running out to buy generators that are gas pa gasoline powered or natural gas powered or solar powered with batteries. Um, are you concerned about that and having these dot the foothills, so to speak? And are they dangerous in a high fire situation? Are they going to explode, for example, in that situation or an extreme weather situation? And what would you recommend of those three for people to, to use? You want to like fire oh, God. <laughs> 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 so most of the commercial generators that are out there, and they're, they're selling a lot of them now, mm -hmm. um, are, are very safe. They're UL listed, so they're, they're certified, and they're built to be safe. They're, they're, the only reason they would explode would be if you had so much fire impacting your yard that yeah. it caused them to explode. But in, if that's the case, then your house is going to burn down. I mean, you know, it's all relative. Um, <laughs> if I had, if, you know, if I was a homeowner interested in, in one of those systems, I would, you know, have an electrician uh, install the right uh, <coughs> panel and the, and the right circuits and, and that, so that you could do it properly. I, I wouldn't just buy a generator and run an extension cord into the house and plug my refrigerator into it. Yeah. Um, I think there's, there's there's some innovative battery solutions, but they're expensive. So Tesla has the, the yeah. home battery yeah. system, but it's pretty expensive. Um, but yeah, this is the reality. Um, if you had to choose I'll, between natural gas and um, gasoline powered generator, what do you think? You'd, which is safer? Well, I, I mean, a gas generator, if used properly, is pretty safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a uh, natural gas system, you're talking about something that's hard plumbed in. Mm -hmm. So that has its own risk too, right? Natural, you know, when you hard plumb in natural gas, you could have a gas leak and, and that can cause big problems. So uh, a completely mm -hmm. self-contained um, <coughs> generator is pretty safe as long as how you hook it to the house is done properly by, by an electrician. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. One of the uh, several jobs that a supervisor has is being on the board of the air air pollution control district. So I'll put on that hat for a second and just say there are much other problem. There are many other problems with generators beyond just the, the I mean, I, I think the greatest fire risk is just plugging in stuff without doing the electrical. Um, but the, the danger to the community is very high from them. Just the institutional generators that get fired up not to mention the much larger amount of residential generators that get fired up in one of these incidents uh, raises our our um, our NOx our 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 primary air quality indicator uh, by by 24 percent. Um, so um, if only the ones that we institutions have hurt your air quality that much. And most of them are, are diesel. So you're talking about like running the community on a carcinogen, right? Um, and doing that for sustained long periods of time. Um, and so I would just say that if we don't want to have more peop more statistical deaths from air quality than we would from a fire, then we better figure out better solutions than diesel and gas-powered generators.
Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that if you if you run the numbers on um, on on certain homes, um, you know, larger homes, older homes, uh, or households that have, you know, uh, 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 more than two household members to them, uh, the combination of solar and battery right now um, is very advantageous. If you do them together, you you get a big tax credit. Um, there's there's a lot of logic in doing that now. Yeah. We, we have another question there. Uh, yes. Uh, I did want to say Costco, at least after the fire, had some great batteries. I'm sure they're available online for individual household use that are you can safely store and power up and they don't cause the problems you're talking about for those of us without a lot of <laughs> money to deal with it. But I did want to ask a strange question but an important question, I think, with all the efforts to plant trees and other things for global warming, is there any county plan about what you would like to see planted and where people who want to care for those trees until they're able to take care of themselves could plant them apart from their own properties? Um, we, do, we do have an approved trees list. Um, uh, uh, Public Works, our um, streets, Division has an approved tree list, and if you see one of my staff, uh, Lisa or Katie, will get it to you uh, because those are the trees we generally put in projects ourselves, and one of the criteria that we're looking at is, will it survive on its own uh, and not die and become a risk? I just wanted to mention a quick resource for anybody that's interested in solar and battery backup or even just battery backup on its own. On Wednesday, November 13th, the Community Environmental Council, Southern California Edison, are having a workshop on exactly that at the Faulkner Gallery in downtown Santa Barbara. You have a question? No? Other questions? Um, if I can continue the topic on the uh, power outages, um, one thing I would like to ask is um, um, if there is some coordination with uh, the, the utility companies and the National Weather Service, the fire departments, and the county. <laughs> what? Yes, I know it's a difficult question. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's it's just a very the the answer is the coordination. They are coordinating with us. Um, so that's fair to say that the utilities are coordinating with um, our uh, emergency operations center and our first responders. But um, it is difficult for us to ascertain what they are going to do. Um, that coordination does not include a greater certainty than what they're giving to the general public as to what they're going to do. And I, you know, I have grave concerns, particularly on um, the effectiveness of their maps, the readability of their maps. Um, that is why the county um, midstream. I mean, I got to give it to uh, our wh whoever does our maps. I got to. I want to meet this person because mid incident, they create created an interactive map um, where you can type in your address to make sure whether or not you are in. Um, one of the uh, affected areas for the power uh, safety uh, shutoff. Um, so um, that's a good time for a commercial. If, go to readysbc.org or uh, and check it out. Uh, it you know play it around with it. Plug in your address. Know how to use it. It's a really useful tool. And that way, um, you you know a lot of people keep on going to lots of different sources and trying to find out what's going to happen. They successfully updated that very rapidly last week through each and every of the myriad changes that were made to the predictions. And so you could get the best and most up-to-date information that way. And uh, Mark, do you want to add something? Yeah. I'll just give one quick plug and Go. then I'll turn it to you because you, you probably have the most to say about it. But uh, and I think Mark's going to reflect the same, um, the, the same sentiment that I have. That uh, So they, they don't ever ask the fire department where they, they should turn the power off. They don't say, hey, what, what are the most highest risk areas that, that county fire would think we should de-energize? 
Um, I'm glad they're not asking us because that, that would be, I, I don't want to be part of that process. I think they should just fix the power infrastructure and keep the power on. We need the power on. It's very difficult. Um, I'm hearing anecdotal stories about this fire up in uh, Sonoma that, you know, once again, people all of a sudden, you know, if their cell phone was plugged into a charger overnight and they thought it was going to be charged up, it was dead. It wasn't charged. They didn't get the text alerts. They, they couldn't open their garage door. That's a huge problem. When the power goes out, some people physically can't even yank on the cord to get it open. And so we're so used to uh, our, our society being powered by electricity. And as soon as you shut it off and you have a fire, that's a problem. And ironically... Um, they did shut the power down and they still had a fire and it possibly was probably power. It's what it's sounding like. So, um, it doesn't even seem to be super effective even when they do it. So I, I'm not a big fan of it. They don't ask us where to do it. Um, they have their own fire scientists, their own weather, they have their own meteorologists are using their own weather stations. Um, there's a, there's some positive benefits. They've put tons of, of weather stations all over their power poles, all over the state of California. That's that's has a benefit, but um, I would argue that there's there's better ways to deal with uh, with the wildfire ignitions than turning the power off. I just it's, it, we, mo most of, honestly most of our fires start on the sides of, the side of roads. Well we, well, we don't shut highways down during the red flag. I mean, I guarantee if we shut down Highway 101 from Santa Maria to Carp during a red flag, yeah, we wouldn't have any ignitions on the highway. Done. Um, but I don't think we are going to do that. So. Um, it just seems w a weird way to deal with the problem, but I'll let Mark. Yeah, um, just for a little bit of transparency, too. When when this first started to kind of gain a little bit of momentum early on and even within internally within our agency, sort of a um, not quite sure how we would work with the utilities. We're, we work alongside them, and we've had meetings with, you know, f for us with Southern California Edison, especially with, you know, we have this, Southern California model consortium that um, we all kind of work together and get get together and talk about high resolution modeling and things like that and it's a real really productive relationship um, within the National Weather Service we have certain policies for who we can provide DSS remember that acronym decision support services uh, we cannot provide decision support services to companies for profit the idea that they they purchase their own services for weather support um, with the exception if it's instructed by emergency management. Now, what we've learned really quickly here this fall is that, um, you know, we've, the number of our coordination calls that we have for any particular event has doubled easily because of the PSPS. And we have counties that are having coordination calls strictly for PSPS. And they will have, and there will be uh, utility companies on those calls and they'll have their meteorologists on the, the call. So PG&E, SCE, sdg and &E have all invested, I mean, millions of dollars in this program with their own uh, meteorologists, with their own weather models. Um, really, you know, practically speaking, we should be looking at Southern California Edison to get some of their, I mean, they've got these much better computers than we have and that we get to use, and we should be really calling them and say, hey, what does the model show? What does your model show? You know, I mean, it kind of goes the back way, the other way. But I'll tell you a personal experience. I was down at the Los Angeles County uh, Emergency Operations Center um, after the Saddle Ridge, or when the Saddle Ridge fire started up, and, and this is, remember, I talked about on-site support. So I, was, I ended up going down there to the EOC, and I sat next to... Uh, this this woman who was she is the Southern California Edison uh, manager for government relations and there she was at the EOC so I'm working alongside her and everybody milling about in the EOC and occasionally they would come talk to her about the PSPS and and keep in mind that at the emergency operations center they had people that specifically the codes that would be charged for the expense for this operation, you've got the fire side and you've got the PSPS side. So they're actually splitting. He said, okay, people over in this room, they're, they're working on the PS, you know, when I say PSPS, that's public safety power shutoff. So PSPS. And, and so um, at the same time, Los Angeles County Office of Emerg Emergency Management had somebody at the Southern California Edison Emergency Operations Center. Okay. So, um, there is obviously, I think, Rob, you put it best the other day when it's, it's a public safety, it's a program for public safety that doesn't involve public safety. Right. So, <laughs> but we're, we're shoulder to shoulder a little bit. Um, we're not part of the decision of where to shut power off. 
Um, the benefit that, that Rob mentioned in terms of the observations, you know, you could, a meteorologist, a forecaster can never have too many observations, never, ever, ever. So um, what they've done is they've installed these um, weather uh, stations on, on power poles um, that is giving us, you know, these critical fire uh, parameters of relative humidity, temperature, and wind. Um, there's, then they also have webcams on them. So you can Google it and go out there and, and you'll find these websites where you can look at all of these different webcams from these sites. And in the, in the sense of early fire detection, that's a pretty important thing. Um, and, in, and in the sense of fire behavior, say if you get a fire that, that pops up, you know, and, and then you can go look at that camera and, and from a meteorologist standpoint, uh, fire weather forecaster from from the firefighter standpoint being able to be able to see in real time what that fire is doing gives you a really good idea of what maybe the winds might might be doing you know if the plume is like laying down flat on the ground like what we saw with this tick fire early on the winds are just pulling that and the, the plume has no chance to go straight up whereas if you're looking on the webcam the plume just kind of kind of casually going straight up okay that's a pretty good indication winds are pretty light um, so there is some positive benefit to this. Um, I think that overall the entire system, including the public safety system, is, um, there's still some training wheels on, on this. Um, I live in an area within Camarillo that I thought going into the first Santa Ana event we might be shut off. I did investigate the possibility of a generator, um, shameless plug for Harbor Freight, um, and I had an idea to run an extension cord inside the cat door <laughs> with the cat door shut. To power the refrigerator, I read that you could, on a 3,500 watt generator, you could run a refrigerator, a computer, and a TV. So um, I think we would be in pretty good shape. I was, I was trying to sell it to my wife, and she was going, "Yeah, okay, okay, okay." And then she said, "How much?" And then she said, "No, nah, that's not okay. We'll just <laughs> <laughs> let's get some ice." <laughs> so I did. It's funny you mentioned don't run the extension cord, but uh, yeah, hey, the public do. You do. Yeah. It, these are publicly available well, I'm not gonna be watching webcams. Well, but I mean, what I'm, it, it's a tool that we can use. And get this, too. We may not, it, it's good all year round, obviously. So um, in terms of what we do, in terms of uh, when we get to thunderstorm activity um, and during the, during the summertime and everything, uh, those are, you know, the worst thing for a meteorologist to be, or a forecaster, is to be in a, in a closed building with no windows. So we have a storm spotter program out there that we'll call people to say, hey, what do you see out there? These webcams are perfect. We'll be able to see thunderstorms developing up on the hills, and that really gives us some good information to help us. Yeah. I was just going to add, um, we're kind of in the process of updating our Fire Safe Council, the Santa Barbara Fire Safe Council. Robbie and I are both on, on that. Um, and one of the things we want to incorporate is a link to show these these cameras because it's pretty vast, and there's, there's very few fires that start within the state that – because they can maneuver, certain dispatchers have the, the authority or the the ability to move so they could look at it. I'd also just note, I mean, it's obvious that the power companies are kind of between a rock and a hard spot on this, but they are devoting a lot of energy and capital into fuels reduction. Part of my um, discussion was knowing your, your neighborhood, um, and if you can, you know, check, check your lines, and if you see anything close, just get on their website, and we found them to be very responsive because, obviously, they, they have a lot of skin in the game, so... I'd encourage that. Yeah, you know, unless it, 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 unless we be too much of a bummer, that, that you know, that that was pr pretty fast. The incident that you're talking about, and you're talking about on Foothill, like it was just yesterday. I sent I sent Southern California Edison the pictures of those trees, and they're right on it. Um, uh, and I would say that Edison is, I I think being. Uh, better about looking at shut, shutting down circuits rather than whole counties. I mean, um, wh when we ask these questions of Edison and the same questions to PG&E, um, pg and es strategy is to sh shut down large swaths, like you know, tens of thousands of people at a time. pg &E, or Edison's strategy is to shut down. You know, a circuit at a time, and sometimes so sometimes that means as as little as 500 customers, um, and so like that. I wish uh, uh, PG&E would look at Edison's strategy on the shutoffs, and I wish Edison would look at PG&E's mapping 
um, uh, and we might be in a better spot. Yeah. One, one Can I just ask a quick question? Being someone that sends out emails to 700 homes in Eucalyptus Hill, got really conflicting information over the weekend. One from SCE, another from the county. At this point, I just care about people's safety. Do I just go with what the county's got as possi possible shutoffs? Do I, s I all of red the red flag? Uh, yeah. I Loyal. just said it's a mess. So Loyal, on the all side of, of the, the all of the county's info on our map came straight from Edison. Now, what I do notice is that um, uh, Edison is hesitant uh, in some of their public noticing, right? And so they do give us information before they send out a public notice. And some people then translate that as a conflict between what Edison is saying and what we're saying. Um, it's, it's not usually a conflict in the mapping because we get the data straight from Edison. Okay, that's the, I just want confirmation. Okay, thank you. As usual, you are on top of it, Lloyd. I want to follow up on, on the previous questions. Number one, I think I found the, the um, link to the cameras, but I couldn't get into it. I, I didn't know how to sign, you know, it required a sign in. So I'm not sure whether I just didn't know how to do it or whether they purposely have limited access to those cameras you were talking about. Yeah, I don't think so because I was at work uh, for one of these events and I didn't, I didn't know where our link was on our pages and I just Googled Southern California Edison webcam program and I think I ended up at their, at their they had, a, they had a, like a media uh, announcement um, on it and there was a link for those cameras. So I, I'm not, I don't think that they're restricted uh, to just, I think it's, it's publicly, it's everybody, should be. I, I hope so, and I, as I said, I may just not have known how to get in. But the other thing that was particularly frustrating to me is that the, um, ah, is that, a, is that the webcam? Um, the circuits, the, the places that might have been shut off, were so confusing. The circuits had the website. Thank you. <laughs> the circuits, some of them had four different names that were shown as places you should, you know, as different circuits. And they had a name that was not shown in the links at all. Um, but shown on the maps, you know. So you couldn't tell that it was the Trump circuit or the Laro circuit or what it was because it would say Santa Barbara map number one or something of that sort. And it would list about Santa Barbara maybe and Mission Canyon and 154. And they may have all been the same actual circuit. And so it was extremely confusing trying to find out which circuits had which addresses in them. And um, so somehow that kind of thing, and I agree um, with, with the, um, some of the previous questions, you know, trying to keep track of which were the areas um, that was, it was constantly changing and the different agencies and PG, I mean, SoCal Edison would have different uh, announcements at the same time. So there needs to be some way to get SoCal Edison to, to work with you and coordinate these responses in, in future uh, instances. 
That is definitely our hope. I mean, I, I do think that the best thing is an interactive map. I would rather have the county not be the one that has to do, do it. I mean, we, we would rather have the utility have an a interactive map, but we stepped in because we felt like there was just too much confusion. So the best thing is to plug in your address into the interactive map. But I, I'll just give you an anecdote. I mean, I, I uh, last Sunday I, I bugged uh, you know Matt Pontist all, all you know like several times during the day, and and you know he just you know he said, hey, you know we've been on the phone with them for four hours today, and we still don't know what what they're gonna do this evening the big for game time right at uh, 3 p.m. when they were supposed to start shutting things off, and so you know. This my last conversation was, you know, one thirty or two thirty in the afternoon. And so, yeah, I, I do think by that time we should probably be able to know what they're going to do. But they you know, this I think process is enough in its infancy that they have not definitely not systematized that even to let us know um, whether they're going to go through with stuff or not. Any other questions or any other comments from the panel? No, we are a little bit uh, after the schedule, so if there is no other question. So the 154 is closed um, north of Cathedral Oaks. Okay. Well, like uh, so, I'd like to thank again the the Office of Emergency uh, uh, Management, uh, the Fire Department, uh, the National Weather Service, UCSB, and uh, the Office of uh, Das Williams uh, for these. Um, uh, panel discussion, um, and I, I think also the questions and the interaction with the community.